So our next keynote speaker is Kadi Borner. Uh, she is a professor of information science at the Department of Information and Library Science, uh, the School of Informatics and Computing. She's also an adjunct, adjunct professor at the Department of Statistics in the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, she is a core faculty of cognitive science and founding director of the Cyber Infrastructure for Network Science Center at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, she's also a visiting professor at the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences in the Netherlands. She is, among much else, uh, curator of the International Places and Spaces Mapping Science exhibit, and we do have um, some selections from that exhibit in the poster session, so please do feel free to check those out as well. Uh, she has an MS in Electrical Engineering from the University of Technology in Leipzig and a PhD in Computer Science for the University of Kaiserslautern in, in 1997. Um, she is a AAAS Fellow and she is also co-developer of the Science of Science tool which will figure prominently in tomorrow's workshop. So please, mail, welcome, please help me in welcoming Dr. Borner. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for all which organized this um, really amazing event. As you know, there have been quite a number of um, Science of Science events recently funded by Marianne Feldman at NSF. I think we had 10 different workshops, events, gatherings last year. The workshop reports should become available very soon. Um, you might like to check them out, but I totally agree that there this event is very special in that it brings together so many librarians which do bibliometrics, scientometrics, infometrics, webometrics, and other altmetrics approaches now on a daily basis to help us all make smarter decisions. And really bringing that knowledge from the research communities to um, those which practice it on a daily basis, that's a really, really important uh, translation step, which I think this uh, event masterfully um, takes. So. I assume I go forward this way. Um, my um, talk is entitled um, Data Visualization Literacy, and you could uh, also call it Network Data Visualization Literacy because networks are actually very, very hard to read for many people. And so I thought I should show you some uh, visualizations of networks. This is a network of international collaboration patterns using Elsevier Scopus uh, database. And as you see, we are very, very global. Science is global. Technology developments are global. There are global brain circulations going on. This is a global marketplace um, in terms of education, in terms of um, products um, that are shared and co-manufactured, but also in terms of how science evolves and diffuses and is adopted and uh, added onto. And it's very, very important to understand this in a very holistic manner. I think ultimately science is driven by positive and negative feedback cycles. Those which fund science need to understand delays in the system. They need to understand who is involved in positive or negative feedback cycles and how can they try to get more positive ones and how can they detect and ideally stop and reverse um, negative feedback cycles. And just to give you a good example of a positive feedback cycle, uh, imagine you're a young professor, you get hired in a tenure track position at a university, you have your um, um, precious startup funds and you use them wisely to uh, develop uh, good research and to publish it in high stick uh, paper and, and journals. And ultimately that of course improves your chances of doing even better research, but also potentially your chances of getting funded in this area. And from there, you will have more resources to do even better research, etc. So that's a very positive one. And you can imagine the opposite of that, um, which then leads to more and more teaching you have to do and less and less resources and time you have available for research. So again, I'm uh, advocating here for a much more holistic understanding of how science evolves. However, there are also maps which are very personal, like this particular um, map, uh, which very much looks like a subway map, which was um, created by a PhD student who couldn't explain to his advisor what his PhD thesis was about. <laughs> and he, at some point, just wanted to give up um, and um, went to the next big city to kind of, I don't, I don't know, forget about it all. Uh, and he saw there um, a subway map and he realized that he can represent all the many 
uh, trains of thought that go through his thesis as a subway map, complete with uh, stations where you can go from one train of thought to another one. And uh, his uh, advisor, Peter Eats at the University of Sydney, is actually a great lover of subway maps. Um, <laughs> And so uh, that worked in that particular case. And in his uh, PhD thesis, in addition to a table of content, he also has this map. And whenever he goes on another train, which is color coded here in different colors, um, he has that train as a kind of visual index into what he's going to explain in terms of his research. So this is a very, very different way of communicating something as complex as a PhD project um, to an advisor. Uh, you might also have seen this topic map of NIH grants 2007. Some of you might even have uh, played with the on online interactive version of it. These kind of maps are very important for understanding what kind of research is already funded. Imagine you could uh, read or, or feed in, in this case, um, the summary of a new proposal that you want to get funded in order to identify not only uh, the relevant um, programs that might be relevant for funding it, but also to see who else is working on that topic. And of course, if you see that somebody just got funded on that very topic, that's bad luck. But at least then you don't have to write all 15 or more pages. Um, you would just see that this is um, already taken. So by um, having um, these topic maps, you can also help uh, identify reviewers. Um, you can also identify potential um, um, publication venues um, and um, potential patents. As you know, the NIH-funded uh, projects are very well connected to um, resulting publications and also to resulting patents. And so using these networks intelligently gives you much more um, smart decision-making capability. How many of you have um, used online MOOCs how many, okay, so that's one third about. How many of you have used Khan Academy? Okay, that's maybe 10%. Uh, how many of your children have used Khan Academy? Well, that's 5%. Uh, you should send them to that side. This really started the uh, massively open online courses, which are now wonderful to have because, first of all, I get to see how other people, other peers teach, and this is really, really uh, unique for me to understand what works in such a setting and what doesn't work. But I'm also learning about topics which I couldn't possibly attend classes for because I'm doing my own job. Um, but all these classes are now openly available for free, which is really a gift to mankind and humankind. So um, please do check out these online courses. But at the same time, you can then also take all the courses that, um, for instance, exist in Khan Academy or in some of the MOOC portals, and you can start mapping them according, them, according to taxonomies, as it done, is done here, or if you uh, do topical analysis according to uh, topical coverage. And then you might like to attend those which are um, highly subscribed to or those which are easy or those which are um, in or next to a topic you just enjoyed immensely uh, learning about. You might also um, realize that much of what is done in science is um, making a true impact in terms of health, in terms of security, in terms of environmental impact. In many cases, if this translation really happens, if these uh, papers are downloaded by doctors and doctor's offices to save human lives, to make sure that parents go home with their children and not without their children, in these cases, oftentimes these papers do not get cited. They are used to make better decisions, to improve health. And in these cases, um, you have download activity, but you don't necessarily have citation counts. And so here you see a map of um, a team um, of uh, researchers um, back uh, when they did this work at Los Alamos National Lab. Um, Johan Bollen um, since then has joined Indiana University, um, which shows download activity data. And um, I won't have time to go into details here, but all these maps are available online. You can zoom into them. And um, what you see here is, however, in the, in the lower right corner, you see the same network layout, but color-coded by arts and humanities in yellow and the hardcore sciences in blue. And um, whenever two dots are connected, it means that somebody first read one paper and then went to the next paper. So that's why there's a link. And you see that much of um, 
what you um, see connected in the hardcore sciences actually goes through the arts and humanities. So it's, it's interesting for me also personally to see the interplay of, you could almost say liberal arts uh, education and training and interest and relevance and uh, relevance of hardcore sciences. Not all maps show networks. Um, some show um, um, landscapes like this one, which is not a, a geographic map. It's again a topic map. Um, and um, again, you might like to immediately zoom in and actually I provided one of those zooms here. And you get to see how some of the big um, companies interlink to each other and how they claim larger or smaller spaces of intellectual um, territory and um, how you could potentially um, navigate from one to another. More and more social media data sets are also uh, mapped and I particularly liked um, Ludo Waldman's comments on the importance of non-English speaking literature. Um, there are some countries, for instance the Netherlands, which have enormous knowledge about how to uh, deal with uh, rising water levels. Um, and this is not only relevant for the Netherlands, but for many, many other countries. However, much of that knowledge is actually uh, written up in Dutch. Um, so I think there is a true need and a true uh, advantage of translating some of these um, documents into other languages so that we can all benefit from it. It's not just um, the case that everything that's important is also written up in English. This is simply not true. And so here you see a map of Europe where uh, different uh, languages are color coded and you see that Twitter activity uh, very much uh, retraces um, major capitals and major highways and train uh, tracks. But you also get to see that in the Netherlands people basically they, bu they bike, they have their texting device on, in one hand, their drink in the other hand <laughs> <laughs> and they're everywhere and it's wonderful. Um, so how can we increase um, data visualization literacy? I believe in today's time and age, um, we do not only need to teach people how to read and write text, we do need to teach them how to read and write data. And by writing data, I mean that they need to find their own ways to uh, take on personal data or professional data sets and render them into actionable insights. And libraries, science museums, and of course also formal education have an, a very important role to play here for giving them this ability, giving many, if not all of us, this kind of ability. And um, just to um, explain our current definition of data visualization literacy, it's really the ability to read, make, and explain data visualizations. And it does require three other types of literacy. Maybe that's why it's such a tough literacy to teach, but it requires that you are able to read and write text because many visualizations come with labels, with legends, with titles, with uh, descriptions, etc. You need visual literacy, the ability to find, interpret, evaluate, use, and create images and visual media. And you also need data literacy because if you have a scatter plot, for instance, or just a timeline, you need to know why certain points are in certain x, y values in that scatter plot. You need to be able to read that. And again, many people, um, for whatever reasons, actually don't like math so much. And we now um, give them more of these plots. And um, it's non trivial to then compete on the museum floor where you have very cute, furry, fussy animals with big eyes on one end. <laughs> and you have rockets going off with a lot of fire and loudness on the other end, and in the middle is your data visualization. How do you make them come to your data visualization? How do you do this? And one trick is that uh, people are really interested to see themselves. In fact, some of my colleagues argue that the best um, science museum um, exhibit is a mirror with a big button next to it. And nothing happens if you push that button. <laughs> I believe we can do better. We can actually have them push that button and see themselves in new ways, see themselves as part of a cohort, see themselves how census labeled them way back in time and today, see themselves uh, in, in new contexts, really. And um, so we are working very closely with science museums to um, get our macroscopes to uh, be on the museum floor because there are many, many people which are done with their formal education and they still have 50, 70, 80 years more to live and they need to get these data visualization skills. 
Another way we um, try to get these skills to many, many people around the globe is the information visualization MOOC. So this is a free, open, online, massively um, attended course. Uh, we have every spring students from 100 countries come in. And um, the course can also now be taken for credit. So if, uh, if you want to get another degree, you're welcome to do so. And um, the next uh, course um, set will start uh, January 10. But right now you can just go there and um, cherry pick whatever types of analysis and visualization you want to learn about. Uh, we are also using the IV MOOC tag, so you can always just check that one out and see the live feed from students um, since 2013 now. So we have been teaching this course since 2013. In the course, um, you will learn that there are different types of levels of analysis from the micro level to meso institutional level to uh, the macro uh, global level and different types of analysis which answer very, very different questions. So if you need to answer a when question, when did something happen or is there a burst of activity, you would go and do temporal analysis. If you need to answer where questions, you would go to a cartography, a geography. You would maybe use GIS systems if you have a license for it. If you have what questions, um, that's a topical analysis, a linguistic analysis. And then, of course, there are with whom questions or network questions where you try to understand citation networks, um, brain um, drains and global brain circulation, but also um, co-authorship networks and how they evolve over time or other networks. And so as you see, these two axes create a table where you can now say, all right, I'm, I'm interested to answer a where question at the institutional level. And then you can go to that cell and you can um, get exemplary visualizations, but you can get also access to tools that are relevant for that level of aggregation and uh, that level of scale. On the global level, you oftentimes now have so large data sets that you need to do some kind of parallel processing and you need definitely a database set up. So that's a different scale, different way of working. On the micro level, it might just be you and all of your team members and maybe you could even do that social network still by hand. So depending on where you are in terms of scale and depending on what kind of type of analysis you are performing, different tools become relevant and different uh, examples exist. In general, the uh, workflow design uh, is as follows. So you have stakeholders. Sometimes it's just a PhD student and his or her project, um, or you and you, your question, practical or research question. And then based on um, the time you have and the resources you have available, you try to get your hands on the best possible data. If you can get access to uh, database data, don't scrape. Try to get to the person who is the owner of the database and get his or her data. Oftentimes it's an institution you actually have to contact for this. Um, because every time you scrape data from the web, it will introduce all kinds of errors. You don't want that. Um, assuming that you now have the best data possible, you would start cleaning that data even more. There's no data set which is perfectly clean. Um, then you would analyze, you would run these temporal, topical, geospatial network analysis or just simple statistical analysis over that data. And then you would start to visualize it in a way so that you and others which need to make more intelligent decisions can take meaning from that data. And in terms of visualization, you would first uh, decide on a reference framework. So you could, um, just use a simple access system or a geo map or a network layout. Then you would overlay data. So you see patterns and density and trends. Um, and then you can take other um, columns in your big data table and you can start size coding, color coding, shape coding, etc. And then you deploy it, you either print it, you have a big display wall, maybe you just have your um, mobile um, device. And you would start exploring that data. Typically, you would see that some data is missing or you really want to zoom into an area so you get more data for that area. So it's a very, very iterative cycle. And when I started this kind of research about 15 years ago now, all these different data readers, data analysis, visualization tools were written in different languages, were typically black boxed and patented. And the data sets, by the way, were not freely available in many cases. And in some cases, they were extremely expensive. So basically just doing one round of this took an entire year. 
fortunately today we have much more um, freely available data sets also to, thanks to NIH and the linkage of uh, for instance funding records to publication and patent data this is really gold for some of these studies um, and then you have tools now available which are also freely available for, definitely for research maybe not all for commercial research um, which you can use to do this basically in a day and if you know what you're doing maybe in, a, in an hour and then you can very rapidly get more knowledge about what's really in that data and you can do geo mapping you can do um, all kinds of other types of analysis and so in the um, IV MOOC you get to work with the SI2 tools that is Apache 2.0 license so you can actually take it and make money with it in fact, we want that because I, in a university setting, cannot provide 24-7 service and many clients actually need that kind of service. I'm not going to be the one providing it, but others might like to go for that opportunity. It's all tax paid um, development so far. Um, funded by NSF, NIH and others. And so in the um, IV MOOC you have um, seven weeks of uh, hands-on training. You get um, theory and hands-on sessions. But then in part two, students work on client projects and some of you actually might like to submit client projects if you have a question a data set and two hours of time you um, can um, submit one of those projects um, which then uh, student teams of four to five get to work on in the second part of the project because I believe that they have to apply what they just learned otherwise they don't even know what they got <laughs> and so uh, in many cases these projects are also very invigorating and very stimulating and highly rewarding for students because they get to work on projects that wouldn't get done otherwise because these are smaller companies which are still trying to explore if this is uh, for them to do these large-scale data analytics or it is uh, government institutions which don't have a budget line item for this yet, or it is uh, not-for-profits which also wouldn't be able to afford this kind of expertise otherwise. And in these client projects, people oftentimes come back with scientific publications or an online interactive interface to a data set that is, have never been exposed like that before. And um, that's another good portfolio item for the students also. And then this is the grading scheme, but again, you don't have to take the course for credits if you don't like grading and midterms and finals anymore. Uh, there are two books which are used in the course. One is the Visual Insights book, which tries to be um, timely. And that's hard because uh, tool development is very fast in that area right now. So after four or five years, this book is going to be obsolete. Um, but it's out now, so uh, use it while it's still timely. Um, the Atlas of Knowledge really tries to teach more timeless knowledge. So ideally, some of the principles, the general principles, the visualization framework which it contains is still valid in 50 years because our human abilities, visual perception and cognitive processing abilities, actually stay pretty much flat constant. We are surrounded by more and more information. We get better and better tools to uh, augment our human intellect but our own abilities are actually pretty constant. So I think that's um, one reason why I believe this can be done. Now in the course, you will see that you can take a, a simple CSV file like the one you see here. And um, as you might um, see quickly, these are actually some of my publications because we always like to uh, kind of eat our own dog food first. <laughs> and you get to see it time cited in publication year, city of publisher, country, journal title in full. So this obviously is a, a web of science data set. You have a title, subject categories, and authors. And you can do many, many, many different types of analysis just with those few columns. You can point um, the site 2 tour in this case, but also other tools, to the um, city and uh, country information and extract geo maps. You can point it to the um, time cited and the publication year, and you can extract uh, timelines um, over time. You can point it to the author. Um, co-occurrence list and extract um, co or evolving uh, co-authorship networks in this case. You can point it to the uh, journal title information and you can do science map overlays. You can extract any um, bimodal networks that you desire and you can extract those and um, lay it out or again animate it over time. So um, the versatility of um, just 
the idea of pointing the tool to different columns and then doing all kinds of different analysis is actually quite powerful. And this doesn't have to be a um, publication data set. This could be your bank account statements. This could be your shopping list. Um, these could be very different CSV files that you encounter in your personal and professional life. So it's not um, specific to uh, science of science studies, but um, given our background and our research focus, many of the examples that are taught in the IV MOOC are coming from uh, the science of science research area. I already mentioned macroscopes. So these are tools um, which are similar to microscopes and telescopes, which let you see things that are too far away or too small for your naked eye to see. But um, macroscopes are actually not physical instruments, but they are bundles of software. And very, very soon, all of you will come into your offices in the morning and you will see, wow, there's a new data set. Or amazing, there is that one algorithm, that one PhD student finally made that algorithm available, which I always wanted. So ultimately, we, I believe we need tools where you can plug and play algorithms very, very effortlessly. And um, thanks to OSGI, which is the Open Service Gateway Initiative, um, which is typically um, used to uh, do modular software design for coffee machines, um, cars, dishwashers, etc. Um, we have added what we call SciShell, the cyber infrastructure shell, which then allows researchers um, from different sciences, also sociologists and physicists and others, not necessarily just computer scientists, to plug and play algorithms. And those algorithms might be written in Fortran and C and Java and other code uh, programming languages. And now you have a way which is very similar to YouTube and Flickr, but instead of um, sharing videos and images, you now share code pieces. And if you do this, you can very quickly assemble custom tools. And um, we have one of these, my favorite um, custom tool, which is the Science of Science tool, where we basically just preloaded um, different data readers, different data preparation algorithms, different pre-processing, analysis, modeling, visualization algorithms, and also a bridge to R, because many of our colleagues are using R extensively for statistical analysis. Um, as you see, the menu is organized from left to right so that you first read a file, then you prepare that data, then you pre-process it. Pre it. So that's the data cleaning, really. That's 80% of your lifetime, just pre-processing <laughs> data. Then you analyze, um, you model, you visualize. And you also see that each submenu then has the different types of analysis because they really benefit from algorithm developments in very different areas of research. So. Here you have pre-processing for temporal, geospatial, topical, and networks. So for networks, you get to see what's available there. Uh, and then for analysis, you also again have temporal, geospatial, topical, and networks. And you get to see that there are different algorithms relevant for unweighted, undirected networks or for weighted networks that are undirected. So that's a co-authorship network, for instance or for directed unweighted, that's a citation network. There are no weights, they are just directedness of citation linkages. Or for weighted and directed, so that would be an also citation network. So I as an also can cite another also multiple times, there's a weight on it and there is the directedness because I'm citing that also. So be careful which algorithm you really use for these ty different types of networks. And then, again, also under visualization, you have, again, this division of uh, labor, if you wish, for the different types of algorithms. The visualization framework then also helps you understand and navigate that very complex space to get from a raw data set to um, ideally um, actionable visualization. Here you have a listing of different insight need types. These are all insight needs you could have, and oftentimes you have multiple of those. There are different data scale types from qualitative to quantitative ones. Um, there are different visualization types, and to be honest, there is no agreement right now, on, even among experts, that um, these are the ones. Uh, instead, I looked at and reviewed major works in that area, and then I decided for the purposes of this particular visualization framework, I'm going to use those labels and I'm going to explain them, I'm going to give examples, and um, hopefully there's more agreement on this in 10 years. But this is really an active line of research in the information visualization community to agree on terminology and on definitions of what even a chart is. There is no um, total agreement yet. 
Um, then there are different graphic symbol types. There are geometric symbols, such as um, circles and uh, squares, etc. But there are also linguistic symbols, which you could size in color and shape code. Um, there are also pictorial symbols, which you know very well from geographic maps. Little tree which is standing, or one which is chopped down, laying on its side. Um, and then there are geographic variable types, uh, which you can use to uh, encode other data um, variables. And there are also interactivity types. Um, very different interaction if you have a printout, you just get closer to it. Um, whereas on your phone, you can do pinch and to zoom. Um, very different from your laptop. If you don't have a touch panel, you have your mouse. So these uh, different types of interactivity also make a huge difference in terms of how that visualization is going to be um, used and um, ultimately rendered and what kind of libraries are relevant for supporting that. Now, um, for the inside need types, and I did this for all of these different uh, types, um, you can go back in time and you can see who else tried to bring order to this. Um, so starting with Patin's uh, semiology of graphics, you can then see what he identified as uh, key um, task types um, or inside need types. And you can look at others and uh, what they identified. And then on the right-hand side, you have um, the set that is used in this particular visualization framework. And similarly, you can um, take any two columns and you can render them as a table. So here you have a table of graphic variable types versus graphic symbol types. And shown here are point, line, and area geometric symbols and um, spatial position, which is a very, very important one, just where to place a data record if you have an XY plot, for instance. But then you also have retinal ones, such as um, form uh, in terms of size, shape, rotation, curvature, angle, and closure. And you see some of them are qualitative and others are quantitative. So it's very important to get right that, for instance, uh, gender should not be represented as a quantitative variable. That would be tough. Um, however, you also, um, if there is a, a true um, quantitative variable, maybe you don't necessarily want to use a qualitative um, shape coding for it. Um, so I think even this simple um, mapping of data to visual representations is not always done perfectly, even by some experts. And of course, that table is much bigger if you map all of them. And just like a periodic table of elements has uh, empty cells, which have not been attempted yet or where elements are not yet known, you also have this here that there are combinations which just haven't been done yet, according to my knowledge at least. And so um, this really is um, opening up um, the space for doing more human subject experiments of which ones are especially effective for what kind of insight uh, needs. But also ultimately it gives you um, a big playing field of what you could try if you wished to, to uh, uh, test out different ways of encoding um, data. How much time do I have? So I have um, about 20 more minutes because I want some uh, Q&A as well. And I wanted to show you what you can now do with these tools and with some of the data sets um, that are available. And I will show you some descriptive models, but um, also ideally get you interested in predictive computational models. So descriptive models would take um, existing data, analyze that data, and then community results in, in these cases via data visualizations. So here um, you see a study which we did with Dirk Helping and his team at ETHZ uh, in Zurich, um, where we looked at the global scientific food web. So um, we took um, the web of science uh, data set and we tried to understand knowledge production and consumption and the diffusion of knowledge across different geospatial regions. And we did this for data between 2000 and 2009. And um, we wanted to understand which areas are knowledge sinks and which ones are knowledge sources. So if you are cited more often than you cite, then you are a source of knowledge according to our definition here. And if you are citing more than you are cited by others, then you act as a sink, in, again, in this particular um, work. And so it was very, very interesting for us to see that China, for instance, is very, very good in attracting more and more um, citation counts. And as you know, it's um, 
soon going to be um, the country with the most citation counts, even overtaking U.S. Um, and of course, it also has many, many uh, publications. Um, however, if you look at these networks of sources and things and their dependencies, um, the dependency on, of the different geospatial regions on each other's production patterns, then you will get to see that um, even though Asia is catching up very quickly in terms of publications and citation rates, um, it actually has a greater dependence than ever on the knowledge consumption from, let's say, Europe and um, the Americas, for instance. And so you can also render this as geospatial maps where if you are a source of knowledge, you have that um, green stick and Harvard University here is especially uh, productive. Uh, but also you have these um, red um, sticks going downwards, uh, the balls, um, indicating that you're more acting currently as a sink of knowledge. And so if you're interested in the details, um, you're welcome to go to the respective um, paper. Another um, project we did with uh, Vincent Larivier and Stephanie Haustein at the University of Montreal is one that again uses uh, Web of Science data um, to understand the win-win, um, lose-lose and, and all the other relationships that exist between different scientific disciplines. So here we were interested to see in how far two um, areas of science that now collaborate get more than the expected share of their citations. So let's say um, biology, or let's say biomedical, and arts and humanities scholar, they get together, they write a paper together. You would have expected that um, definitely the arts and humanities scholar wins because there are so many more citations in the biomedical sciences that he or she could benefit from. But is it also true that the biomedical researcher wins? So we try to identify those pairs where both sides win, where they both get more uh, citations than would have been expected if they just publish a paper in their respective uh, disciplines. And so here you get to see the percentages of these win-win um, to lose-lose uh, relationships. Um, but you can also overlay it over a map of science, where here um, we only looked at those with um, more than 10,000 citing papers, because otherwise it's a big hairball and you can't see anything anymore. Um, but um, you get to see which ones are the win-win relationships. And you could say, well, there must be something good about those because obviously these are highly cited papers. But in some cases, these are long, long distance relationships uh, across um, the um, landscape of science. And we are using the UCSD map of science here, which um, is color-coded. And I think you also uh, might be able to read the um, labels of these different uh, disciplines. And so that was uh, done using these uh, two tools. So um, I think you get an introduction to that as well tomorrow. Um, there are also lose-lose relationships. And uh, as you see, some of those links are very strong. These relationships are done again and again and again, even though they lead to loss in, in both domains in terms of scientific impact. It could, of course, be that these are real cures. These are real changes to um, security or other elements you care about. But in terms of citations, there are areas and there are pairs that consistently uh, lead to more lose-lose uh, outcomes. So again, uh, if you're interested in more on this, um, please go to the respective paper. I wanted to mention, uh, because I think there are some of you which might have access to the raw um, Web of Science data set or to raw Scopus data, or which have started to use the Microsoft Academic Graph data, or some other larger data sets which now exist out there. There will be a workshop at Indiana University uh, in November which brings together the data stewards. These are not the researchers, these are the data stewards and managers that uh, take very good care of these raw data sets. And the idea is that um, each of those teams um, which um, finds the resources to purchase one of those larger major data sets, they spend an enormous amount of time on cleaning that data, on starting to um, do author disambiguation, on rewiring citation networks even. And this is data which is not spent on research. This is data just getting the data under control, putting it in a database, etc. So the idea behind this uh, very unique collaboration with the uh, Knowledge Lab at, uh, in Chicago, Eamon Dude and um, Thomson Reuters, who uh, is the financial sponsor of this event also, is to bring these data stewards together so that they can show each other 
what code already exists to, for instance, parse the raw XML data in which you receive that data, put it in a database. And in uh, the case of Indiana University, we have it in a data enclave where anyone employed by the trustees of IU can use that data. Whenever you want that, some data to come out of the data enclaves, that's a different story. You have to go through our data captain. You can't call him data stewards. They're official data stewards at Indiana University, which has that title. But our data captain with a real uh, captain hat, um, he um, then would have to, uh, okay, that data comes out of the enclave. But inside of the enclave, you can uh, share code to analyze that data. Um, you can share code to interlink that data and so on. And so at the event, um, we will have demonstrations of how to set up such an enclave. Um, we also will have demonstrations by other teams which have spent decades in some cases to uh, do also name disambiguation, institution disambiguation, geolocation coding, science coding. Also teams which have spent much effort and won awards for uh, doing prediction of gender, ethnicity, and career age, which is very relevant for these kind of studies. And of course, there are other teams which have started to interlink Thomson Reuters publication data to other publication data sets to patents, funding, social media, clinical trials, and, and other data sets which are relevant for a more holistic understanding of science technology developments. And so um, if you're interested in, in learning more about this effort, please contact me. I think it's important that we start sharing this kind of code, even though we cannot share the data, but by sharing code, we could, for instance, get to a point that whenever you have the resources to purchase this or other data sets, you can run open code to get it in a database. You can other, run other open code to clean it, to link it, to do some of the predictions I just mentioned, and then we could all reproduce each other's results. Wouldn't this be nice? This is a hallmark of science, so this is extremely important to get right. So again, um, please contact me if you're interested to learn more. Those of you which um, haven't seen uh, the maps of science, there are now 100 maps, um, so that's 10 years of uh, curation effort by many. Uh, there are 240 map makers from around the world. And if you love maps, just go to scimaps.org to zoom into them. They make great uh, Christmas gifts. And uh, by the way, we use the um, income. It's very minimal, but we use that income to get more and more of those maps into libraries, into um, classroom settings, and also to ship the exhibit to many, many places around the globe. Um, you might know that we just committed to another 10 years of the exhibit. And to be honest, I don't know I'm gonna, how I'm going to finance this in 10 years. Um, none of my research projects is 10 years long. But um, so far, it has worked very nicely. So um, we just um, thought we should do this. The um, phase two of the exhibit is um, shipping not um, static maps, but interactive um, data visualizations to many, many different venues. So. Ultimately, I believe it's, it's wonderful to just see, see science from above by just looking at a static map. But what people really want to do is to zoom into an area, to click on a record, to get the details, to start reading that paper, to see how it's linked to other um, records, etc. And so these interactive uh, data visualizations allow you to do this. And uh, instead of having a call for maps, now every year we have a call for macroscopes. And so we have... Um, the first set of macroscopes available online. And so if you want to check them out, that's your link right there. Um, but you can also um, check out some of the um, interactive visualizations um, um, at um, the NIH library. So we actually have a touch panel display where you can already kind of pick one of those 100 static maps and make them really large. So I hope you have fun um, interacting with that. So the former maps you were not supposed to touch, here you, you are supposed to touch it. So this is a big touch panel and nothing happens without you uh, touching and exploring. We had the exhibit at the CDC and it um, goes to Iowa State and um, some other places next. And um, if you're interested to host the exhibit, it really is a wonderful way to open people's minds and hearts to the um, 
beauty, complexity, and the value of science and technology. And oftentimes institutions add their own maps, like CDC uh, did a major effort to add maps of health, which was wonderful to see. And they also have this uh, very impressive um, David Sensor uh, museum setting. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's quite fascinating. And they have a lot of really interesting um, museum artifacts also on epidemiology um, relevant uh, artifacts. Predictive models. How many of you have used um, agent-based models, game theoretic models, um, systems dynamics or network models or any kind of other um, predictive modeling um, toolkit to help understand science technology developments better? Can I see a show of hands? Let's see. There's one, <laughs> two, any others? Okay, this is, this is relevant. I should be doing this. As you have seen, it's, it's, it's very, very informative to just go back in time and analyze old data. But wouldn't it be nice if you could kind of fly the future before you write a check? And what I mean by this is to really understand what the impact of different decisions might be. If you are librarians, you might, um, librarian, you might have the option to purchase one collection or purchase another collection, sorry. Um, and that might have an impact uh, in your environment. If you are a program officer at NSF or NIH, you might also like to understand what the impact of different types of funding is. Should you fund workshops to have those two communities grow together? Or should you issue a call for um, proposals where you require that there is one from that community and one other co-PI from another community? What is going to be the impact of this all? And, um, some of these questions we can't answer yet because we don't have good success criteria yet. But there are some other areas where you can actually do some, some beautiful um, studies and some beautiful advice with uh, appropriate confidence intervals and probabilities for very important questions. So as you might know, if you do computational models, you actually have to make your assumptions explicit. You have to identify what are the entities in your system and how are they interlinked to each other and what are the causal relationships between different um, elements in your system. Um, you will try to describe the structure but also the dynamics of a system. Um, these models can then be used to explain that system. You know how, for instance, does the educational system work? And um, you can then start to suggest possible interventions. And oftentimes, these models also help you identify new questions. Um, there are many challenges. Um, model utility and usability is, is a big one. Um, many of these models require advanced math. Um, many in this room and in many other rooms are very happy that they don't have to have math um, topics anymore covered. Um, and then, of course, um, credibility and validation. How do you validate these models? So you need, again, high-quality data sets. In um, research, but also in um, practical applied settings, you then have to be um, extremely um, serious about how can you extend these models, and ideally you can reproduce them. Not only with the same type of model you just used, but ideally with a different modeling type. And if you still get the same insights, the same results, then you better start trusting these models. Some of you might live in Florida, and there it's very normal that you get um, both models, the European and the uh, American model, uh, shown on TV whenever a hurricane comes close. And some people trust the European model, some trust the other model, so both are shown on TV. I believe in the beginning of um, modeling science technology innovation, we will have multiple models. And uh, over time, we will learn which ones are more correct, more easier to understand, more actionable. And um, thankfully, there are many other areas of science, including epidemiology, uh, weather forecasts, etc., where models are very commonly applied on a regular basis using large real-time data feeds. And um, these communities have figured out um, how to best share and retrieve and advance modeling efforts, how to do standardization around these modeling efforts, etc. So we can learn, we as science, technology, and innovation researchers, we can learn from those other societies. 
today we do have quite a number of um, high quality data sets available and they are interlinked and they have quite high coverage. Um, we do have the storage and computation that's needed for doing large scale modeling efforts. Um, we have some of the um, algorithms that are needed for this kind of effort, but I think we still need more development in that area. And uh, it will also require visualization and animation capabilities in order to then communicate results of these models to a large audience. You might know that uh, it took a hundred years between the first weather forecast done by experts and these weather forecasts being used um, by a general audience. A hundred years. I don't want to wait so long. I just don't have that time. So we have to figure out how to do this much, much faster. So um, in May this year, thanks to NSF funding, we had a conference at the National Academies um, that brought together government, academic, and industry leaders to discuss um, opportunities and challenges associated with these kind of modeling efforts. And I would like to um, bring to your attention that um, many companies, they use modeling, computational models, um, almost everywhere in their business process, from hiring the best people to doing great marketing to routing uh, packages from A to B uh, to doing good customer service, etc. They use computational models everywhere. And you could argue why wouldn't higher education use computational models everywhere? You could argue why wouldn't NSF NIH use computational models in many, many of their decision-making processes? And it's not to be replacing human expert judgment, but it's a calculator. You wouldn't expect anyone to multiply two very large numbers in, in their head. This is just another way to augment human intellect. So, again, if you're interested in this line of research, and check out the report. I think uh, it's very informative in terms of what happened at that conference. And um, hopefully more of you get to get interested in not just analyzing uh, data, but really developing computational models. There's also a special issue of Scientometrics on simulating the processes of science, technology, and innovation that just came out. And... Um, it has all kinds of interesting um, topics and uh, and, and research uh, results, including modeling collective discovery processes with the Noble game. Uh, so there are game theoretic approaches, there are network uh, approaches, there are agent-based models. So again, uh, please uh, check those out. Um, you might know that it always takes another step. So if you have a special issue, if you have a um, um, review book in um, Scientometrics, for instance, that's not necessarily useful for my mom or for many people like her that need also a better understanding of how tax dollars get converted into funding for research and uh, technology developments, get converted into cures or other benefits that they personally can enjoy. And so... Um, there is this um, set of uh, atlases that um, is meant for doing yet another step of translation. But we also um, just got um, the okay from the National Academies to run a Sackler colloquium on modeling and visualizing science and technology developments. So this will take place uh, next October at the uh, Beckman Center in Irvine, California. And um, we are hoping to uh, get together yet again another set of uh, experts in that area of um, modeling science technology developments um, using some of the best models available and some of the best data sets in existence today. However, then when you have done um, your modeling effort, you do need to find a way to communicate results to a general audience, maybe also to experts, but also to a general audience. So you could argue, oh, if you could just inform the top 1%, the smartest of all of us, of how science technology really works, then we would be all so much better off. No, I would argue that you need to inform everyone. Just like everyone needs um, to be able to read and write data, we all need a better understanding of how science technology innovation works because we are living in the information age, going towards the innovation age. We need that kind of understanding. And so we are starting to prototype at Indiana University what we call science forecasts. And these are some snapshots from season one, episode one of the science forecast. 
Uh, it's actually on YouTube. If you just look for it, you can um, watch the entire episode. But you have here a um, um, moderator who actually guides you through uh, developments in science. Uh, in this case, the lady in red. Um, and she um, basically helps you understand collaboration patterns. You have seen that um, visualization in the lower left before. And it helps you zoom into certain areas. It then blends over to an interview here um, of Johan Borlen. And um, by the way, our VP for research, our vice provost for research, turns out to be a great Larry King kind of anchor. <laughs> and he's just really good at it. And he even, he even comes with uh, suspenders. And it's just, it's just wonderful. <laughs> And so we are now up to uh, season one, episode three, and it's done by a class of journalist students. We don't have funding for this right now, but these students, they do magic. And so um, it's, it's just a really neat collaboration across campus. And um, by the way, VPRs, they really like interviewing researchers to really understand what really is going on in that area, uh, because they have to do a lot of other jobs uh, in their um, normal uh, professional day. So you might like to ask your VPR if he would be interested to be an anchor as well. And then maybe you prototype these as well at your institution. And then we get to see what works best. I would love that. This is very much in the spirit of kind of um, MOOCs, which are also open, free, and we get to see what works in these online environments. Um, maybe prototype your own. If you are interested to learn more about these efforts, please um, do come visit us on uh, Facebook and uh, follow our um, uh, Twitter feeds. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I think we have a um, few more minutes for that. And um, that's the end of my presentation here. Thank you. Is there any questions? No, that could, yeah, there's one. Sorry, I, I saw this one first, but then there's another one over there. Do you want to battle it out? Yeah. <laughs> What's the feedback loop like between the scientists who are working on the code and the vendors who are producing a lot of the data? Mm -hmm. So again, that workshop in November is exactly for that kind of feedback. I think Thomson Reuters would like to understand how this data is used what kind of cleaning, interlinkage, prediction is already done. Maybe there is room for academic industry partnerships. Uh, I think that would be actually my dream come true because um, ultimately researchers need funding. Thomson Reuters might actually get some of the best algorithms this way. I think it could be a win-win situation. But then, of course, there are other types of feedbacks that would come from the library system. So again, this is researchers using the raw data in a big database. But I think the kind of feedbacks that you all get uh, is very important also for um, uh, vendors to understand what works and what doesn't work. Yes, please. Could you elaborate a little bit on uh, the idea of forecasting, looking to the future uh, with respect to input, output um, processes? Where, in your experience, what are some of the bottlenecks or uh, things that need to be worked out in order to So this is very specific to the different models that now exist. So for instance, um, one model that we implemented and um, validated, uh, and this is again in collaboration with um, Johan Bollen and some of the other colleagues at Indiana University. So uh, we are lucky to have um, 16 researchers at Indiana University which do science of science studies, either as bibliometricians or web or metrics or um, scholarly communication or social science approaches to, to studying science by scientific means. And so um, one of um, these teams of us, um, we implemented the so-called fund rank uh, model. And so that's a model where instead of Congress giving money to NSF, NIH, and other funding agencies, and then these agencies um, putting out uh, calls for proposals, and then researchers like myself um, writing proposals, but also reviewing proposals, instead of this current system, you would have an alternative system where each one of us is um, 
researcher and a funder at the same time. So once a year, I would log into an online portal and I would receive some money, let's say 100,000, which seems to be um, the amount that you get if you take all the funding divided by eligible um, researchers that are currently eligible to apply for this kind of funding. So you give each one of us 100,000, and then we have to give a certain fraction away, let's say 50,000, so half of it. And we can give it to anyone who we think does good research. And good research might mean many things. It might mean that they develop a tool that I really need for my research and that really empowers my research. Or they generate students that I really want to hire as a postdoc. But in many cases, it might mean that they do excellent scientific research, they publish in high stake papers. Uh, journals, they are editors, they are um, doing a lot in terms of scientific advancement. Um, if you do this kind of fund ranking system, then you will effectively uh, create another power law. There will be some which are stuck with their 50,000, and if you ask them to give away 100%, they might have nothing. Uh, but there will be also some which have a lot of contributions by others because they are highly valued by many. In year two, then, these um, researchers, all of them, get another set of 100K, but they also then have to give away what they got in the previous year. So um, some of them will have to um, think careful how to distribute so, so much funding. If you um, run this kind of model and you get all the data from that model and then you compare it with how funding is currently distributed, um, you get almost a one-on-one -on -one correspondence, but at a much lower cost because in this particular case, you wouldn't have the funding agencies anymore. You wouldn't have all that time I spent and many of my colleagues spent writing funding proposals. And uh, I personally actually think it's very valuable to write funding proposals and to get the review or comments, but it's a huge expense in terms of time and, and money also. So um, there are now uh, efforts to validate this um, particular model in real. Um, in a kind of in vivo study. So you take one area of research, you try to divide it into two comparable cohorts. You have the old system still running in one, and you implement the new system in the other, and you just see how they go forward in time. So this is a study where you um, see that you have an agent-based model, which gives you a very different um, way of distributing funding. You will compare it with past data, but you can now also implement it in a kind of in vivo setting. So this is the kind of modeling which I think we will see more and more in the future. And again, there are different types of models relevant for um, modeling different aspects of the science technology innovation system. Mm -hmm. Kati, you mentioned the November event for data stewards. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you know if Department of Defense is participating at all? Because there Not is an yet. enclave being yeah. built for all data analysts across the department, and we would definitely like to have people attending. Yeah, please, please, let's just talk more. So I think this is a unique opportunity to basically save 80%, which we typically work on data cleaning, and have that 80% for research. Wouldn't that be nice? Huh? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, um, sorry. My colleagues at uh, the University of British yeah. Columbia have just done a study looking at the investment of data sh uh, large data sharing repository infrastructure for supporting um, the library's investments. And even though um, they are supporting a, a large number of researchers, only a very small uptake has happened to date. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are in regards to perceptions of data sharing and its implications on modeling mm -hmm. knowledge. If you are a researcher or a graduate student or anyone who enjoys NSF NIH funding and you create a data set for your research, um, then you typically have um, exactly the amount of money it takes to actually create that data resource for um, your own purpose. If you want this data to be truly useful for others, you would need 10 times that amount of money. 10 times. Most of us don't have that funding. And plus, there is no true incentive oftentimes to share that data, but it's really a research issue. I mean, many of us would happily be doing this. Um, I think many of us are all into open data, open code, open education. Those three go very well together. But it's a, it's a pure issue of resources. 
So 10 times, whenever you can tell somebody, here, give me 10 times the amount of money I got for just creating that data source. If I now want to have a good data dictionary, a good um, table schema, a good documentation of how to use that data, and some hand-holding for those which might have never run a database query in their life, this is where that uh, amount of dollar comes from. And I think I'm out of town, uh, time. <laughs>